you take your Bible tonight, turn over to 2 Timothy in chapter 3, if you would. <clears throat> if you go to 2 Timothy in chapter 3, and you'll notice down to verse 1, the chapter begins like this. It says, This know also. Now, of course, he's speaking to this young man, Timothy. Paul is in jail. He's exhorting him in a number of areas about the, the congregation that he is presently involved in uh, overseeing. And he deals with him about the, the need to be uh, diligent in his study, to help these people to grow. In a very near sense, he's talking about here's your people that you're dealing with, your church, their challenges, you need to move forward. He says, but as you do that, know this. And certainly we need to know this as well. We have a fundamental Bible-believing church. You know, a fundamental Bible-believing church is full of sinners that have been saved by grace. Now, if it's not, then it's not a fundamental Bible-believing church. It's just a meeting place for religious people. Doesn't mean that everybody in here is saved, but for the most part, uh, our position is we believe the Bible. We admit that we don't keep everything in it, but we know that we're in the wrong and not God. So just like the man Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, you've got some folks there that need to grow. They need to make progress, but make sure that you're leading them in the right direction. Yes, you're going to err. Yes, you're going to fail. Recognize your failures. Call them what they are. But as you do that, know this. Now, this is a prophetic passage in a sense. I don't know that Timothy saw it uh, fulfilled specifically. But like any passage, Timothy could have looked around and may have seen symptoms of what he's going to mention here. He could have seen it happening in a way, but he's also speaking prophetically that it's going to take place. Because he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time defining the last days except a couple of comments. Because I I'm myself am still in the process of, of looking at some things about the last days. I'm not dogmatic about how to define those. Some people would say that the last days concerning Israel differ than the last days when it refers to the church. There's probably some validity to that. Some apply the last days because of the statement in Hebrews 1-2, uh, in these last days God has spoken unto us by His Son. They would say it started right at the ascension of Christ. And then, of course, the idea that they're last means all the way to the end of the age. So there's a number of things to consider. But I think we can at least look at it like this. Because uh, the book of Hebrews does say that in, in times past, God spoke unto us with the prophets and so forth. But in these last days, has spoken unto us by his son, that any group during the church age could say they were in the last days. That is the last part of what God was doing dispensationally. You know, the last part of the age is the millennium. But these are the last days before the second coming of Jesus. That is, he's going to come and rapture his church. There's going to be a tribulation, and then he's going to go into a millennium. Now, I only say that because when Timothy read this, he was in the last days and that Jesus had already ascended. But there's clearly a reference here to something that is going to gain traction in the future. It is going to get worse as times go on. He says, this know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, he defines the perilous times like this. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, I know if you read that passage, and we could define each one of these individually, you look at that and say, well, boy, if there's anything ever been true in the Bible, that's true. I mean, we live in those the days where we're seeing this fulfilled before our very eyes. I mean, do we not see people that are lovers of their own selves today? covetous, proud, blasphemers, boasters, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, unthankful, unholy, all of that, certainly we see it getting, waxing worse and worse as the time goes on, more of it takes place. But I want you to stop for a moment and think of this. What was the world like before the gospel came along? 
I mean, the Jews had the Bible in the Old Testament, of course, pre the coming of Christ. But before the book of Acts and before the great evangelistic movement of the church of God, what do you think the world was like? Well, turn for a moment to Romans chapter 1. You can hold your place in 2 Timothy if you like. But turn to Romans chapter 1. Paul here tells us that uh, in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That is, they suppress it. They hold it back. He says in verse 21, because when they knew God, you notice this is all past tense, they glorified him not as God. This is verse 21. Neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet and we can keep right on reading now He's talking about a pastime. You want to know what it was like here before the gospel came along? Men were sinners. And they had vile affection. They, had, they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. If, you, if man is let alone, if God doesn't restrain him, just how bad can he be? See, he's saying in 2 Timothy 3, just know in the last days, perilous times are going to come. Men are going to be bad. Paul said, let me remind you, men have always been bad. Now, men are bad because what happens, we live in a culture, and in our thinking, and I say this is probably true in many cultures, not just the United States, but we would see it more pronounced because we've had a greater uh, number of saved people that probably live in our country more than likely than a lot of places in the world. So we are in our culture appalled by many things that are taking place in Romans chapter 1. We're bothered by it because we've been influenced by a reformation and another reawakening and revivals that took place and you know we the gospel has gone through and there's enough saved people to say God is not for that. So we look over here at 2 Timothy 3 and we think to ourselves, well yeah I mean we're getting to a place today where they're almost living as bad as they did in Romans chapter 1. No, well it's not almost They clearly are living as bad as they did in Romans chapter 1. Here is the difference in the two chapters. Here's what he's warning Timothy about. He's not just saying, Timothy, you know, in the last days, men are going to be bad. No, men have always been bad. Every one of these things we mentioned, the world's always done it. But the influence of the gospel came in and restrained the world to a point. It, It put some restraint so that somebody can't just get away with these things, you know, uh, the world, the reason that we even define, and people misdefine it all the time, there's a lot of political correctness today about hate and discrimination. Well, why is hate and discrimination wrong? It's the influence of this book. The book says hate and discrimination is wrong. That's interesting that what they're telling me I can't discriminate against, the Bible condemns. I mean, they're mixed up on their definition, but understand every good thing that happens in the world any morality that we have a handle on is the influence of this book. Now, here's what he's warning against, because here's the verse that I didn't read in my text. But notice verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know what he's really warning here about the last times? He's not saying men are going to be bad. They've always been bad. He's saying church folk are going to be bad. He's saying, Timothy, in the last days, what constitutes itself as a church, the religious crowd, Christendom, is going to look like this. 
Now, you know what? I haven't changed what I said before. We're seeing this fulfilled before our eyes. And as I said, Timothy might could have at that time perhaps even looked around and maybe in an isolated way found an incident of it. But as the days progress and we come closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to progress. We are living in a day-to-day where it's difficult to tell the difference between what is so-called Christian and what the world is like. There's not a whole lot of difference. Now, there ought to be a difference between a truly born-again person and the world. But I'm talking about the sphere of Christian profession. You think about how many people out there that have a form of godliness. You know, the idea today behind this the, the mega church type mute movement and I say that not just because a church happens to have a lot of people and it's big I'm talking about the philosophy of the mega church uh, we're trying to do everything we can to look like something Hollywood produced and just add Jesus to it I mean that, it's out there the whole entertainment focus of the church to be just to uh, make you feel good because you showed up I mean what that is producing is a bunch of people that are religious but no change Now, you do not get saved by changing. But when you get saved, you get changed. You know, there is nothing impacting about a person simply standing up and say, I I was saved. That doesn't really impact anybody. What impacts is when somebody knew you before you got saved, and they see something different about you now that you are saved. Not perfection. You know, here's a person, uh, uh, an unsaved uh, couple. They're married or maybe they're just living together, whatever it is. And one of them gets saved. Well, you know, because they're saved, they either want to get straightened out and get married or maybe they split up altogether. The other one doesn't get saved. But even if they're married, that unsaved person is going to look at their spouse or partner or whatever it is and they're going to say, look, they're still not perfect. I know them, they're not perfect, but I'm telling you, Something is different about them. See, salvation does change. And I'll tell you what the the church entity that we have today is missing the change. And the last days, perilous times are going to come. Look, we're not going to be perfect until Jesus comes. But there ought to be some difference in a believer. I mean, we ought not look like, act like, have the same attitude like, even dress like, entertain ourselves like, Go down the list, anything that is related to what the world is doing that I look at and say, you know, God's not really in that. I ought not to look like that. I mean, in a sense of act, look, be, whatever it is, there ought to be a difference. He said in the last days, this is what they're going to look like. Now, of course, we could deal with each one of these individually, and there's, there's a, plenty of sermons to preach about what, the, what it's going to be like, but you think about it today. You go back and... Um, Maybe the late 1800s, early 1900s, I read a lot of those uh, men that lived during that time. And it's not unusual for me to take a book out and I'll turn over and I'll read uh, C.H. McIntosh. And, you know, he was a Plymouth Brethren. I'll I'll pull out R.A. Torrey and I'll read some of his stuff. He was a Congregationalist. Uh, Bob Jones Sr., he was a Methodist. Um, You might pull out somebody else that might even uh, sometimes find something Uh, I don't own any books like this, but there were some good men back then that might even have been Lutheran. Um, They had revival meetings, and and the reason they could get together and they could have one together is there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between them. They all believed the same gospel. They believed this Bible was the Word of God. Jesus was the virgin-born Son of God. Uh, One of them baptized by immersion. The other one dry-cleaned them, and they didn't agree on that. You know, one of them took communion one way and another one took communion. And, they were, and those were differences and they, weren't, they didn't throw them out the window. But they said, I'll tell you what, one thing we agree on. We believe the only way to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what's happened today is we've become too isolated and independent. And we just don't want to get along with anybody. Look, we didn't leave. They left. And we're not to follow along because he said, right, if you'll notice this, uh, having a form of godliness but denying the power of, from such turn away there is an exhortation for us to separate from it and not that you're better than but he's saying look I'm standing let's just say this pulpit is where God's standard is 
and we're trying to be as close to this as we can. And maybe some other folks are over here from this other denomination, whatever it might be, and some other folks are right here, and we're all standing together. Just so happens the Baptists are right dead in the middle, but I mean, we're all, we're all standing right here together. Okay? Well, now, if these people decide they're going to just shift a little bit over here, I don't say, well, you know, I want us to stay close, so maybe I better just shift over here. No, I best just stay right here. From such, turn away. Because really, when I start moving to the left, and I start moving away from the middle to the right, what you're doing is you're dimming the light. Oh, yeah, you stand out. Now, I understand there are some folks that, that, that take right positions with a wrong spirit. I mean, I've heard folks preach. I agree with everything they said. And I didn't even want to be there because I felt bad for the other folks. Their attitude was so bad. I mean, you know, I understand. You can take a right position, have a cocky attitude about it, and, and be belligerent. That's not my point. But if we're right, we ought to stay right because the church, it said, that the, the Christianity is going to move away from the truth, having a form of godliness. And there's all kinds of extremes on this. I mean... I mentioned a lot of times religious television. You know what I mean by that. How many different religious channels are there? Every gamut of thing you can turn on. And that doesn't mean that everybody on there is bad. I'm sure you can find uh, a couple of pro. I think Pensacola has a television program. That, he preaches the gospel. It's not the fact, that, but you know the gamut that's on there. Everything you can imagine. Uh, Bill Ashley just brought me a little flyer. Um, they're having a big healing meeting somewhere. I think he's going, but I, I'm not going to go. I'm not. Right. Uh, but, you know... If you want religion, you can do anything you want, live any way you want to please, and be part of it. And it's no problem. Now, we ought never get to the point as a church where we don't want sinners in the church. Oh, my, we want people to come hear the gospel. But if we ever get to the point where we say, look, all you need is a profession. In other words, all you do is just say, I got saved. You look like the world, act like the world, do everything just like they do, go right along the way, and as long as you just say, now, I'm not going to decide whether or not you really are. That's for God to decide. But I can still hold the standard high. God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. I mean, as a church, we can still take the position and say, look, when you get saved, God makes you a new creature. It's all about our testimony. How are we going to demonstrate to the world that there's a difference? And so he's saying here, there's some going to have a form of godliness but they're going to deny its power. Now, you notice here that the, uh, as bad as that list is, he says in verse 7, they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, the more we uh, go on in our society, the closer we get to the coming of Jesus, there is a lot more knowledge. They're constantly learning stuff. I mean, there's plenty of knowledge out there. Who would have believed when that was written 2,000 years ago that you could take your phone out and say, okay, Google, or say, Siri, or, or even if you don't know how to do that, hit a button and just ask your phone a question, and it come up with the answer. And you know if it's on the Internet, it's got to be true, right? So, I mean, you know, find out the information. But the information is at your fingertips. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge. And, I, I mean, I'll tell you, there's stuff that I, somebody will bring something up, and I'll say, you know, I remember hearing that in school, but I can't really remember, uh, you know, who was the third man on the, on the spaceship when it landed on the moon? I can't even think of his name. You know, who, and you just ask your phone, and it'll tell you. Stuff like that, it's usually right. Uh, we've got knowledge is out there, but knowledge is not what this world needs. They need knowledge of the truth. And you know who's going to tell them the truth? Is the church. I don't mean just something with a steeple on it. I'm talking about born-again, blood-washed, believing children of God. Now, no doubt, if you went around and you found some churches that you didn't agree with, you found some that you said, man, their testimony is really not vibrant, they're really not taking a good stand. In fact, I can't tell much difference in them in the world. If you went through, you'd find some genuinely saved people in there. There's saved people in those churches, and they themselves may even be learning on their own and they might be trying to grow and so forth if anything the church may be holding them back because in this same book what's it going to tell timothy to do preach the word be instant in season out of season rebuke exhort with all long suffering at doctrine see a church has got to stand for preaching 
it's, it's faithful to the book, going through what God says. And, and boy, you, you know, you, you've known it before. There are some that believe they're the only church that's doing right, the only one that's out there that even takes the right kind of stand. There's plenty of churches that are still doing right, still trying to take a good stand, still teaching the Bible. I mean, God's got his remnant. There's no doubt about it. That testimony is around, and there's still people being saved, by the way. You know, just this past week, I was telling my wife, I said, things hadn't changed in 20 years. You get lost teenagers out there, you preach the gospel to them, they get saved. The gospel works. It, it does. But how much more effective when we draw that dividing line and Pete, the world looks and says, that's what Jesus does to folks. They live like that. When you don't have Jesus, you live like this. The line is drawn. Hey, that's the way it used to be years ago, right after, uh, especially as some of these revivals took place or in the early days, in the 1800s. The lost crowd knew they were lost. The saved crowd said, hey, we're not perfect. We're everything we ought to be, but, you know, we've, we've been changed. We're different. There was a line drawn, and, boy, that line is being blurred today. I mean, the, the state of so-called churches today, they're focused on just how many folks we can get in and just come as you are, leave as you were, um, man, come as you are, but listen to the gospel, listen to the message, let's see a change in your life. And by the way, as I said before, you don't get saved by changing, but boy, when God saves you, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He starts on the inside, and he changes the inside so well that it just can't help but spill over to the outside. So he talks about here the, the corruption. Now, these last days, um, just one more thought on this. When you define those last days and you think about it, he is telling Timothy to know that it's going to take place. It's going to happen. So what is his responsibility in the midst of it? Well, in the midst of it, as I said before, he first of all turns away from it. But you also recognize that it's taking place and you keep on doing what you're supposed to do. You don't give up, nor do you get discouraged, nor do you say, well, it just looks things are just going to... Like the light's going to go out here. No, it makes your opportunity for your light to shine that much better. You know that we have a unique message as far as our church is concerned. You know, um, not that we would be motivated this way, but here's a new church that comes into town, and boy, they pop up all over the place. You know, they're meeting in here, meeting in a school, meeting in a grocery store. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of those were gospel preaching, solid churches really trying to reach somebody with the gospel to get them to change? And listen, I'm not judging their motive. There might even be a man who comes into town like that and he genuinely thinks, well, the only way I will be able to reach them is if I just give them something to entertain them to try to get them in. Okay, that, he may, He's just wrong. I'm not worried about the motive. I'm just talking about how we ought to operate. But there's churches all over the place. And you know what happens is one of these mega church philosophies come in a lot of them don't make it, but they all think, I've got to have my niche. Man, I've got to have something that makes me special. They'll paint the ceiling black, get strobe lights all over the place. Some of them even put a coffee shop right there in the, you know, you can just buy a cup of coffee and sit down at your table and just kind of enjoy the music, because it's mostly what it is, a bunch of music. Um, you know, and boy, this sets us apart. We're different. Um, you know, we got hazelnut and the other coffee, you know, they don't even have that in the other churches or whatever. But, you know, we're not trying to motivate this way, but we have something unique that we offer at this church that is not like most of these churches that are popping up. Now, the fact is, we've, uh, it, there's a copyright on it. Jesus started it 2,000 years ago. We're just doing what folks have been doing. The church, preaching the Bible, singing the great hymns of the faith, trying to serve God faithfully with humility and say, man, we come short, we err, but we desperately want to grow, and we want growth to have some practical aspect to it. It ought to change the way I look, the way I talk, the way I act, the way I interact. It ought to change my burden for the lost. It ought to, uh, there ought to be a difference between Frank Bailey pre-salvation and Frank Bailey post-salvation, and it ought not just be stagnant. It ought to be an ongoing difference that's taking place in my life. And it ought to be evident. You know, you change somebody, it becomes evident. And so we want to be changed. Now, we see the corruption there, but this corruption doesn't last because if you'll notice in verse 8, 
As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You say, man, you're, you're talking about church people? I really believe it is. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. You know what Janus and Jambres were? That was Pharaoh's magicians. They were the ones who he uh, would always get to emulate Moses when he did a miracle and so forth. They were basically his uh, magicians. They claimed to be religious leaders of, of Pharaoh's gods. You know, the thing that the biggest enemy to the gospel are religious leaders. I mean, if a man, you know, is a drunkard, he's not an enemy of the gospel. He needs to be a recipient of the gospel. He's no different than any of the rest of us. Man's a drug addict. He probably just tried to do something to impress his friends, or he might have took, got a surgery and got hooked on the stuff and just became an... He just needs the power of the gospel. But the enemy of the gospel is the man who actually tries to send out a message that this Bible has errors in it, that Jesus was a nice person and he had some good things to say and we can just follow his philosophy of life, but he's not the virgin-born son of God, the only way to heaven, very God in the flesh, uh, the miracles of the Bible, they've just been exaggerated. The first 11 chapters don't apply because that was just tradition. I mean, all of this stuff, that liberal hogwash produces the kind of watered-down churches that we have today. I mean, he says that Janus and Jambres withstood M Moses. They withstand the truth. Now, they shall proceed, in verse 9, no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. You know, you read those chapters of uh, Exodus, and you see um, the magicians did the miracle also. They, they turned theirs and uh, staff into a snake. They could turn water into blood. They could get frogs to come out of the river. But when God made lice, made a very living being out of the dust of the ground, they couldn't do that. And it was manifest they couldn't do what God could do. And let me say that the people today, I mean, I, I can't help but use, I, I think I wouldn't even be slandering the man. Uh, you can just go listen to some of his stuff and read it. I hesitate to mention names, but this person, if you, he's so well known, Osteen. Okay, huge church, growing. And people said, well, how this must be of God. Look how big it is. Look how much is going on. But, I mean, by his own admission, he doesn't believe Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He just has a religious, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm part of, I mean, I'm a Christian, so, yeah, i got to mention Jesus. That's essentially what he said. But I'm not a, I mean, I can't really decide who God's going to let go to heaven. Well, I can tell you how you can find out. Open up the pages of this book because God has some re revelation. My, I'm not just picking him out to slander him, but I'm saying, look at the size. It's big. It's huge. People are coming, but if the folly will be manifest you know you're going to go there looking for something and if you don't get the gospel you're not going to find it i mean he'll constantly tell you how god's got this huge plan for you oh man he'll use justification sanctification resurrection uh propitiation and everything else and all he means by it every time is there's some divinity in you that if you'll just cultivate it god will let it come out no there's no divinity in you unless you have jesus you get him in there and you don't just have to cultivate Jesus. Jesus will cultivate you. Now, he says the folly is going to be manifest. I don't know about you, but, I mean, I could listen to the guy for five minutes if I could make it that long, and I'd say, what is this? That's nothing but a bunch of fluff. I mean, that is just, not, what are people getting out of this? It's just nothing to it because if you know the truth and you hear the fluff, it's evident. But most people in the world, I mean, he, he, I don't know if he ever carried, I don't even know if he opens a Bible. I never have looked at it long enough to see. But they just think this is, I mean, God's in this. Jesus is in it. Now, I mean, he mentions Jesus and probably talks about the cross and everything else. Isn't that godly? And they don't know. It's not manifest immediately. But when he doesn't have anything to give them, it becomes manifest. There's emptiness there. Uh, Janus and Jambres were impressive. I mean, they could turn water into blood. They could make a stick turn into a snake. They could get frogs out of there. All that was, I mean, they could emulate, and the devil is a great imitator. 
You see, it's interesting. He uses these men as the example because the devil is an imitator. Do you think the devil doesn't have some churches? Listen, I'm not one bit worried about the church of Satan, which is a, a bunch of atheists who just really are doing that as a parody, the church of Satan. They don't really even believe in a real devil. I'm not one bit worried about how uh, the world is going to be affected by a church that claims to worship the devil. They don't get bunches of members. They don't have television programs, and people aren't flocking to go to the devil's church, okay? I'm far more worried about somebody who claims to be of God, uses the fallacy of, oh, yes, we love Jesus, the Bible, and all of that, but doesn't really believe it, and is undermining. They are like Janus and Jambres, but God says their folly is going to be manifest. So there's a, there's a corruption there. And then notice the contrast. But, in verse 10, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. You know, I think a man who claims to be saved, but he's a lover of his own self, covetous, a boaster, proud, a blasphemer, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. You know, I just... Uh, I think of this, this illustration comes to my mind. We have a little thread on the softball. Some of you come out and watch our games. Um, obviously, people are people. Men are men. We got out there playing the other day. I, I run into home, and me being as skilled as I am, I was frustrating. All, you know, the, the guy was all frustrated because he couldn't get the ball fast enough uh, in there to get me out. And it wasn't because I was fast. It's because the ball was too far away. But anyway... <laughs> Time I come running into home, the pitcher runs up to catch the ball. He sees me go by, and he expletive. This is church league, by the way, okay? Um, that's happened a couple of other times. Uh, hopefully nobody on our team has done that, as far as I know. Just uh, a minute ago, I don't think he'd care, but Anthony, he, has, he knows the people out there or whatever, he puts out and told us, guess what happened last night? Cleared the benches, fight. Somebody got in a fight, both teams out there on the field, uh, brawling with one another. Now, does that look like the church? That's church league. Do you know even unsaved people would listen to that and they just think that was very funny. Isn't that funny? Church league, out there having a fight. I, as soon as I read that, I thought that sounds like a typical Baptist church. I mean, but anyway, I mean, on the one hand, here's people with a form of godliness. They're proud, just like the world. They'll even blaspheme, just like the world. I've heard Christians who get upset and say, Jesus Christ, man, that's blasphemy. Don't take his name and use it in vain. He saved you, and you could just spout it out like that. Uh, boasters, you ever known any uh, so-called religious people, probably some truly saved people that are backslidden, just proud, cocky, boastful. I mean, that's not what Jesus wants to do to your life. Listen, I am a sinner. I am capable of, of doing any one of these sins in a moment of temptation because I still have this flesh, but my life ought not be characterized by that list. But Paul says, you have fully known my manner of life, my doctrine. You've seen it. There's a contrast here between his purpose, his faith, his long-suffering. What is the purpose of a life of a man who's really born again? Isn't it going to be different than a lost man? Isn't, isn't the faith of a saved man, he's going to look at that a whole lot different than a lost man? What about long-suffering? That's what the word that triggered my mind about that fight, that brawl. I mean, that, here's, here's, if there were truly born-again, growing Christians sitting out on that field. Now, do I believe that every one of our uh, members on our softball team are all growing, solid, good, godly Christians moving forward? If I thought that, I'd be naive. Now, I'm not thinking of any particular person who's not, but I'm just saying I'd be naive if I said, well, everybody on Tri-Cities... Uh, the softball team, they'd never do that. I mean, you got me mad enough, who knows? I might do it. But anyway, uh, I'm not being above. that. You understand where I'm coming from. But if both of those teams were, had a majority of people on their team that were growing Christians that were trying to do right, the last thing in the world that they would ever do, they'd say, man, you can cheat, you can get me out, you can call it a ball when it's a strike. I don't care if you give us four outs. I mean, no way I'm going out on that field and kill my testimony. You just, because that's the purpose, long-suffering, 
that's where the direction of my life is. I mean, you, it would be so tragic in the heart of a person who's right with God to say, I can't, man, I wish I'd never play softball again if I had to kill my testimony like that. I mean, that's the way you would approach it. But you understand, and, and I'm not, I have no idea who those churches were. I'm not even aiming at them. That's not my point. But I'm saying that you can be religious. You can have a form of godliness and it not impact you to the point that it makes a difference. Paul says, you've known my life. And it did make a difference. You know, I've seen, I saw Paul lose his temper. In the book of Acts, they reached up and slapped him. And he said, God's going to smite you, you whited wall. And they said, you didn't know that was the high priest? He said, well, no, I wouldn't have said it that way if I'd have known it was the high priest. I'd have said, God's going to smite you, Mr. Whited Wall. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he, I mean, he could get hot, right, under the collar. Now, he also had this in verse 11. Not only his charity and his patience, but his persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, and Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's the contrast. Paul says, look, Christians are going to head in one direction. Lost people are going to head in another direction, whether they be religious lost people or just outright. And he says they're going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And certainly we see that played out in our day. But you know what the answer to this is? He says, Timothy, know about it. Be aware of it. But he says, let me tell you how to overcome it. If you look down real quickly here, in verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let me tell you how subtle the devil is. Do you know there's a modern translation that says all Scripture that is given by inspiration of God is profitable? You know, even that, that's how these very people take a passage that was there to tell me how great the Bible is, add one word to it, that is given by inspiration, implying that there's some that maybe is not, but if it is, it's good, but only the part that's inspired. It's all inspired. It's inspired of God. You know how to combat what's, you say, boy, things are waxing worse and worse, and even folks that are saying to claim to be religious are getting so bad, the testimony shattered. I guess we, it ain't going to get any better until Jesus comes. Well, the point is, even if it waxes worse and worse, you know what shines brightly? It's this old inspired book that he has known from a child, the Holy Scriptures, and that's the key. I mean, we've got a weapon, the sword of the Spirit, that the devil just cannot contend with. It's not philosophy, it's not new methods, it's not, that's not the weapon. I'm saying the power, what we've got to stand on, what we've got to promote, what we've got to use as our uh, force to be reckoned with is the power of the message of this book, and that's the message of the gospel. Let's go ahead and stop there tonight. Lord, how we thank you for your word. And Lord, what a great blessing tonight to know that we have this book that is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable to, to us. And we thank you for giving it to us and even telling us ahead of time how things would be. Men have depraved hearts and apart from the grace of God, apart from salvation through your precious blood, we're just sinners ourselves. So I pray that you'd help us to be the right kind of testimony. May we be growing. May we be heading in the right direction. In Jesus' name, amen. 414 is going to be our final song. We'll stand and sing a stanza of 414 and then we'll be dismissed. When we walk with the Lord.